I'd like to talk to you about systems that you might find in residential properties, certainly in the US, and light commercial properties, and some of the bigger commercial properties like hotels. You tend to find it a lot in nursing homes in Ireland and the UK, but in America it's a very popular system. I'd like to look at it and see talk about the energy effectiveness of the whole situation. So let's get started. The system I'm referring to is the one where you would have a boiler, a conventional boiler with a low loss header used for central heating and a separate boiler used for domestic hot water. In this situation the separate boiler would be the water store so when the water loses temperature the flame, a fixed uh, size flame, so no matter what the draw of water is a fixed flame will come on and heat the contents of the store. Cold water is introduced to the bottom of the tank through a cold inlet pipe and the hot water leaves the top of the tank. The main problem I find with these is that if there is sufficient water to last the day in the tank but someone say washes their hands or has a shower for a few minutes the boil will fire again and bring it back up to temperature when there might be absolutely no need. They tend not to have time temperature control or sorry time control. But even if they do have time control, it only brings it on for a, a period of time. And it does not mean that, that uh, during that time, if someone draws off a nominal amount of water, that the boiler won't waste a lot of energy uh, using a full flame to just bring up maybe a few litres of water back up to temperature. Secondly, we look at the heating system and you find that the system that is very normal up to the advent of more efficient boilers would be a, an atmospheric burner or a standard boiler of any description where you would have a low loss header so the flow leaves the boiler passes through the low loss header through an air separator back through the boiler pump and back into the boiler and is heated in that circuit. If the water expands in the system a pressure vessel is typically attached to the air separator but here you can see that method of operation is that the flow leaves the boiler, passes through the low loss header downwards and back down through the return into the boiler. In the meantime if a zone is calling, the zones will take the water away and the coldest water which is what would be uh, most beneficial to the boiler, depending of course on the type boiler, is mixed with the returning water coming down so the boiler gets a mixture of high and low temperature and if it's a, an atmospheric boiler like the one shown that might be one of the parameters that the manufacturers would have recommended at that time when that type boiler was uh, was being manufactured because uh, the, the water, the return water temperature would have to be above a certain level so as not to form condensation within the boiler. Whereas with modern boilers which are by far more efficient, uh, by far cheaper to run, rely on the coldest water going back. In this scenario with the low loss header the return water, as I say, is contaminated or mixed with the warm water from the boiler, so it can't get back to the boiler to cause condensation. If you look at the central heating output, so on the side, the primary side would be the boiler feeding water into the low loss header, where you would have an air vent on the top, passes through the low loss header, through an air separator, on the on the return water to skim the air out of the system. Quite an expensive bit of uh, equipment, particularly when it's added to the cost of the low loss header. What we'll talk about in a while is that the cost of the method I would suggest would actually be cheaper for all of the system than just those two components alone. Uh, on the secondary side, sorry as well, the expansion vessel here on the primary loop would mean that if the water is expanding within the heating system that a rubber diaphragm within that will, will cause the air to collapse to, to be expanded into by the water and as the system cools the water will push back out again so it keeps the system safe. On the secondary side you have a pump that pushes water out if you have a low loss a, a low system low temperature system here you could have the pump pushing through two ports of a four port valve and back to the boiler or back to the low loss header around in this circuit and of course it's passing the three valves shown in this example where one might be say for living area one might be for a formal area or a conservatory or something and the last would be for 
something like a bedroom circuit. The pump is just continually pushing water around the low loss header when any of these zones is calling. Generally speaking, a fixed speed pump tends to be very, very inefficient. Uh, certainly is uh, against regulations now, are about to become against regulations because they're so electricity hungry. In this situation, so it's quite a lot of pipe work, quite a lot of bits and pieces to put together. And there's really a lot of energy waste because even the warm air that would be in the room, uh, having, even if the pipe work was insulated, uh, you still find there's a lot of air in the boiler area that is heated and that's the very air that's being drawn into combustion and fired up the chimney and out and away from the building. So th the whole system, to my mind, is very, very energy inefficient and it dearly needs to be looked at. So we're going to move on and look at how that system, system can be remedied using a, an energy zone manifold. Energy zone manifold so uh, comes pre-insulated and it, in this unit it's a four zone unit and you'll see that inside if you remove the front cover of the insulation there is the metal energy zone unit itself. If we take the front cover off that you see that the energy zone unit is divided into three areas. If a boiler delivers a flow in from the right hand side at R1 being the top right hand connection R L1 being the top left hand connection, that water will start at this point here and move passing each of the zone opportunities here to go back to wherever it came from, back in the boiler. So the boiler's only job is push water through this which acts perfectly as a low loss header as well as a zoning device and many other features you'll see. But when the water is passing it offers itself to say, this zone pipe or the second zone, or zone three, zone four. In that situation, the water passing through, if there's any air in this, in it, uh, it passes an air scoop, which is uh, built in, and does not need additional equipment besides the standard automatic air vent on top. And as water is traveling along, this chamber is about four or five times greater than the pipe delivering. So the water slows down by that amount. And if it does, air collects here, is caught at this point, scooped and is delivered out with a, a standard uh, off-the-shelf automatic air vent which you would fit at this point in all situations whether it would be directly onto the unit at the top of an expansion in an open system makes no difference this is where the air would be drawn from the system if you're going to mount the energy zone unit it's a good idea to put whatever fittings you're going to put onto the unit while it's on the ground it makes it much much simpler in this situation you can see the automatic air vent ready to catch any air that could be passing in the water and it vents it very first instance and continually forever every time the boiler delivers water in or the zones deliver boiler in air water in the automatic air vent will uh, get rid of that air and let the system perfectly clean uh, good water air being one of the worst enemies to a heating system because air causes rust and corrosion within the within the heating system which can do colossal damage over a period of time. To mount the unit, you would remove the insulation and at the back there are two brackets. You'll note the brackets are mounted about 25 millimeters or an inch from the wall and insulation passes down in that space so there's no heat loss from the manifold into the wall. So you mount the unit securely onto the wall. It, typically it's best to mount it onto a solid concrete or, or stone wall. But if you have to mount it onto timber, it's a good idea to put something like insertion rubber or some kind of a rubber uh, mask behind the thing so that it stops any slight vibration that might go through from pipework or from the pumps operating. So when the unit is mounted, you're, you're ready to start piping your system. Of course, it's a very good idea to make a little diagram before you start. And you see that, that the logic of this system would make it very simple for a diagram to be created. The flow chamber, as I was saying, where water flows in from the right or from the left, that will cause heat to be captured in that area and be made available to any of the zones, the outlet zone flow pipes. If that is, well, heat then is drawn away by a zone, as in, say, with zone 4, we introduce a pump. 
if the pump draws heat away to whatever it's going to heat, it'll be taking the hottest water, no matter what zone it's connected, the same temperature hot water is available at all times. And when the water returns back in, it's collected in a lower chamber and this water, as opposed to the standard low loss heat, uh, uh, header method, this water is separated from the other water. So if this is being offered back to say a high efficiency boiler, such as a, a condensing boiler or a heat pump, it's the coldest water that's offered back first and that would be supplemented only by any residual uh, heat that leaves the boiler that is not used by the zones. But so therefore the energy zone manifold makes the system from the very start by far more efficient. You'll see that in this zone it's just a, a straight pump with a straight connection back in and there's no extra equipment. But if you were to use, say, a zone for radiators or for underfloor or whatever you're going to use, it's a good idea to put a non-return valve on the return in that will stop any inadvertent circulation that might drift out onto the pipework. If, uh, particularly if the pipework rises above the unit, as I'm going to show in this example. You see that on this situation we have a pump and open connection at zone 4, pump non-return valve in zone 3, pump non-return valve in zone 2. Let's talk about a low temperature circuit. With a low temperature circuit, you simply put in a mixing valve and here's your pump. As opposed to the last example, you see that this is a standard three port mixing valve. If the pump needs temperature, it will take it down through the uh, flow pipe from the hottest water available, through the mixing valve and off out. The water coming back would be delivered into the lower chamber and be taken back to the most efficient boiler equipment connected at that point. If the water comes up to temperature, the mixing valve will block the port drawing water down and open the bypass port. So in other words, the pump will deliver out to the zone and back around the bypass situation and out and, and so will maintain a perfect temperature at the low temperature system. By adjusting the knob on the top of the mixing valve, you can increase or decrease the temperature accordingly. It of course would be a good idea to have a gauge at this point to show what temperature is being made available to the particular zone. If we move on and say we're going to introduce a boiler. In this situation we have a system boiler which would typically have a safety valve, pressure vessel, pump all built in. A by far more economical way to go about the system, by far more effective, by far more compact. So the flow would be delivered in as you can see into the top chambers uh, and then the return water coming back from whatever zone would come back and be fed into the condensing boiler, uh, maximizing the condensing opportunity and therefore increasing the efficiency of the system. If you look at zone two, we would take our flow pipe work off through the pump and off up and back down again on the return from that zone and again into the lower chamber and zone three exactly the same situation. The reason that I didn't put a non-return valve on zone 4 is because that circuit would be used to generate, say, domestic hot water. In domestic hot water, it's always a good idea, whether you use an energy zone or not, to put a non-return valve as the final connection to whatever heating coil you're going to use. Uh, I would strongly recommend that the heating coil should have at least the same power in the domestic situation as the boiler output and that when the water is calling, all of the energy should go in immediately, heat the water as quickly as possible. The boiler would be at high temperature at that point in time if you pick a boiler that has a, the ability to go to high temperature when there's a domestic water call. And as the hot water becomes satisfied, the boiler would switch to a lower temperature output and therefore you can control the temperature of the heating circuits very, very simply. But when the water leaves so the pump here, as you can see here, it travels through a flow pipe, through an isolation valve, in through the non return valve, passes through the coil, heats the water, and the coldest water again is returned back into the lower chamber, and that's what's drawn back to the boiler. If you now look at the domestic hot water and how that would be worked, that's where you simply have cold water coming, being fed into the top of the unit, say in this example, down through a pipe and it arrives at the bottom of the cylinder. It's heated by the coil and it, as it's heated it rises up and as it's at the top of the cylinder hottest water is drawn away and that's the water that would be used for domestic purposes around the premises. 
again, it's logical and, and true regulation that you'd have a safety valve of that just in case something goes wrong. In some situations as well, it's recommended by manufacturers to put a, a domestic water pressure vessel. But really, that's something that the manufacturers would be best to advise on. You should always follow the manufacturer's advice in fitting any equipment to do with hot water or central heating for all of the appliances. I've shown here a boiler on the right hand side, but just suppose we want to put a boiler on the left hand side. Quite simple, just use the top connection for the flow, bottom connection on the left hand side for the return. And you have, uh, so it makes no difference. Again, a very, very simple change order. But just suppose you want to use two boilers, again, not a problem because you can now parallel the two boilers you could if you wish set one boiler just suppose at say 70 degrees uh, and the other one at say 75 degrees both of them would come on and come up to 70 degrees when one reaches 70 it turns off and the other one will keep the system hot of course that would be dependent on the type boiler or what how you're going to go about your control mechanisms but you could have a boiler on the left or on the right or two boilers in fact other, other videos will show that you can actually even put more boilers onto this unit if you wish. So if you look, what we have is a difference between the old and the new. The difference between having to put in all of these bits and pieces put together and the conflict of having to try to get the coldest water back to the boiler, which is impossible because the low loss header will, uh, will be mixing hot with it continually. Also the fact that if you have a minor amount of central heating needed and some hot water you have to fire two boilers to satisfy both of those conditions whereas in this situation you have one boiler that can modulate down to whatever amount of energy you're actually drawing off based on the hot water demand and the central heating demand if hot water is needed it goes to full temperature it heats the water and when hot water is not needed it goes back down to satisfy the exact heating requirements for whatever is necessary around the building. So a completely more efficient way of going about the system. Basically there are no moving parts for zone isolation in this. With the conventional system you have motorized valves so I mean if a valve doesn't open or is open when it shouldn't be open you've got mechanical parts that can go wrong. With this if a pump isn't running and hasn't power then the zone won't work. If a pump runs, then it will pull water from the hottest area, send it to deliver the heat, the coldest water comes back and does precisely what the boiler manufacturers would recommend it would do. It would take the, to offer the coldest possible water back. Complete difference in the two systems. Hopefully you'll find this informative. As always, this information has been brought to you by Energy Awareness, the makers and distributors of the Energy Zone unit. Hope you found it interesting. Please contact us if there's anything we can do to help you understand it any better or to help you install or go set about designing systems. Thank you.